So Alberto is the founder and head of the Met Office Informatics Lab. He's an associate professor in computer science at the University of Exeter and an Alan Turing Institute fellow. He has led the many research projects with top teams in the industry as well, including DeepMind, Microsoft, and Amazon. And prior to that, he led the R&D and implementation of a climate prediction system as the UK Met Office. His work focuses on problem, probabilistic predictions, scalable infrastructure for research, and data science. And his research has been published in some like, over 50 papers and received many awards. And uh, so, yeah, I'm very excited today to uh, have Alberto share his perspective on the applications of AI to environmental sciences and climate. So thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for, for having me. As I was saying earlier, I, I have really enjoyed the week, even if I have only been able to attend a few, a few of the lectures. And, and thank you very much to all, all of the people who are here now and, and for sharing the to choose your, your Saturday morning with me. That's that's really good and really, really, really happy. So first thing is, it's a real pity that we are doing this over the internet and, and that the summer school has become the winter school. And, and despite that has nothing to do with climate change. I thought it was funny that that <laughs> even, even the climate had changed for this for this conference. So I will not say much more about me because thank you very much for, for the, the introduction. Just, just a quick comment that I spent kind of 15 years or so really working on, on climate and weather and, and developing prediction systems. And six years ago or so, I got a bit frustrated because there is a lot of data that gets generated from these activities that is really beautiful data, but this is still too big, too difficult to use. And that means that a lot of people actually is not being able to make as much as they could from this data. And that was the reason that I founded the, the informatics lab and also got into other things like doing a, a master in, in business strategy and innovation and so on to really understand how to bring people and organizations into, into doing change. And one of the, the good things of that was working at the University of Exeter, the creation of a new center for doctoral training that was really bringing together different areas of expertise from data science and computer science and environmental science and physics and so on. And now I'm, I'm literally just about to move to, to Microsoft. So I'm, I'm literally just, this is one of the few last things that I will do as, as Met Office in, in February, I will be moving to Microsoft and taking there the sustainability science lead for, for the European region. And some of the reasons for that will, will come clear during the, during the talk. So this is very much a personal perspective. So please do not blame my current or future employers for, for anything that, that I say here, because this is very much my personal perspective on the issue of environmental and, and climate research with, with AI. I should highlight, by the way, that I, I'm not by any means an expert in machine learning, but I I very attracted to the idea of how we can use machine learning and artificial intelligence to really change the way I do we do things in this in this particular research area. Because I'm going to be talking quite a lot about climate. I wanted to start actually by remarking something about the environment and biodiversity, because this is at times kind of forgotten. And this is a, a relatively recent paper. I think it was published in, in 2017 in which they were making very clear, it was a review a study of many other, other papers, around 40% of the insect species are declining and pretty much a third are, are in danger. And, and, and this is a really drastic change. And, and the reason that this is very important is because plants and insects are what sustain the whole kind of pyramid of biodiversity. So we need to remember that the health of these ecosystems that are kind of at the bottom of the pyramid is really what is critical to, to sustain life as, as we know it. And even more recent, kind of a couple of weeks ago, at the, at the PINAS magazine journal, they, they published this paper, which is another review in which they, they went even kind of further and just declared it a kind of an insect apocalypse. And, and there are three main re reasons for that in terms of, of the main causes, which are agriculture, the habitat loss, and, and climate change. And, and again, this is the way that these things are, are linking together. So we have a a clear relationship here between what happens in the environment and what happens with climate change. But we need to remember that in many ways, the problem with climate change is not that we have to save the planet. The planet will, will survive. The planet has been here for millions of years and, and will continue being here. The, the real challenge here is to save life as we know it, because otherwise we really may be in a planet that is not able to sustain us. So this is um, an observational plot 
of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere from the 1960s until now. And I'm just showing this because it's, it's quite useful at times just to remind ourselves of what is happening. And we can see there is a clear kind of trend to increase the amount of, of CO2. And as I say, this is observed data. This has nothing to do with models or anything. And equally, this is a, an observed plot of the changes in, in temperature. And what we see on the left is the changes in temperature in this case from the nine, uh, 1850s to, to the present with four different data sets that have different methodologies and, and so on. But as we can see, the, the agreement is, is remarkable. So this is in terms of the, the global average temperature in the, in the world. And, and we are around kind of reaching one degree warmer than it was against the baseline, which in this case is, is 1960 to 1990. On the right hand side, what is interesting to see, and this is a snapshot of, of these same data sets for, for the, the, the recent period, is that the trend that we are having has a very different kind of signature in different spaces. So the fact that we have a one degree increase globally doesn't mean that everywhere in the globe it has increased one degree. So we can see that there are regions, particularly areas like Siberia or, or kind of the Canada, part of the world, so kind of the, the northern stratropics and so on, that the temperature increase has been much, much higher. And we are already recording temperature increases of 2.5 degrees over, over there. And again, this is, this is very important to remember because this is just observed data. So this is nothing to do with, with models. And as Raya was commenting yesterday, so non-stationarity is a challenge. And, and we need to remember that to, to ourselves that the issue with climate really is a non-stationary problem. So we have these very clear trends in which things are changing very rapidly. So even if you have very big data sets, these data sets are non-stationary. So this has to be kind of very, very high in, in our minds. And of course, these two things that I have just shown, the increased CO2 and the increased temperature are, are related. And, and, and again, that has nothing to do with models that just essentially quite basic physics in terms of the, the balance of, of radiation in a, in a particular body. And, and what is happening is we have radiation coming from the sun. I, I'm not being able to see my pointer here, otherwise I would be pointing to things. But as we can see in the in the yellow lines, we have incoming radiation from the sun and that's hitting the earth. Part of it is being reflected by the clouds. And then the earth, after it has kind of taken hit, is going to put it in, in terms of radiation back into the into the atmosphere. And the clouds in many ways act as a blanket that return that that hit back into the into the the earth and and this is literally the greenhouse effect and, and we have to remember that the greenhouse is, is in principle a positive thing because it's, it's increasing the temperature and facilitating that we can live in this planet otherwise things would be much much colder the problem is that the more co2 that we pump we alter this balance and we have already gone from around 278 parts per million that we had before of co2 to already around 400 400 parts so what does kind of the, the IPCC, the, all of the, the kind of the climate change uh, scenarios and, and all of the climate change report that we have been publishing for 30 years and so on. So that, essentially what we see there is that the warming is, is quite unequivocal and, and unprecedented. And this is literally the language that is used in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for, for Climate Change. And, and it says not only that the warming is unprecedented, but that the human influence is the dominant cause. So, so that's, that's fine. But again, as I was saying, I, I wanted to emphasize that the, the whole point here is if you look at this kind of big timeline that I have put in the, in the bottom that goes from, from kind of 500 millions in the past until, until now, the issue is not that the planet Earth has not experienced this kind of temperature. So I have put the, the label there of the dinosaurs. Uh, and the, at the time of the dinosaurs, yeah, we had kind of much warmer temperatures. The problem is that since human beings, in at least what we consider kind of modern human beings in the form of Homo sapiens have, have appeared around kind of 100,000 years ago, we have definitely not experienced anything like this. And, and this change is, is a remarkable thing that can affect, again, the, the ability that we have to live in this, in this planet. 
another important thing to remember, whatever we do now is going to be what we suffer for quite a long time. So this graph goes from the kind of the, the 2000s up to the year 3000 here. And what you see in the top are possible scenarios of emissions of CO2. And what you see in the bottom is actually what would be the concentration of CO2 during this period. And this is something that we don't think about enough uh, in, in my experience, which is that the CO2 stays in the atmosphere for a very, very long time. So whatever we are doing now, and, and particularly whatever we do in the next kind of 20, 30 years, which is what we really expect to double the amount of CO2 that we have in the atmosphere, will have consequences for many generations to, to come. So what you can see in there, so there is a clear difference between the blue line, which is kind of one of the most kind of conservative scenarios that we are able to reduce emissions very, very rapidly. If you look at the bottom plot, the concentrations that we have of CO2 are actually quite small going into the future and still much higher than they, they used to be. But if you compare that with the red line, in which essentially is kind of a very much business as usual scenario, the concentrations of CO2 will stay in there for a very, very long time. So again, this is a problem that we need to remember. This is not just something that we have the luxury of thinking about in a hundred years time. It may be definitely too late then. And now I wanted to talk a little bit or start talking a little bit about models because until now everything has been observations and, and some potential scenarios which are essentially socioeconomic scenarios of what could happen in the, in the world. But as I was saying, we can, we can do a little bit of maths and calculate if the radiation changes in this way, what, what happens to the temperature. But we don't know exactly how much happens because this is what I haven't mentioned. There are certain feedbacks that are uncertain. So for example, the, the relationship between the clouds and the radiation. So we are not sure whether there would be too much high clouds or low clouds. We are not sure what will happen with the sea ice. So if the sea ice, for example, disappears, we are going to be absorbing more radiation because the ice is kind of white and therefore it reflects radiation. And this gives us this uncertainty in terms of what is going to happen once we double CO2 in terms of the global temperature for the world. And it's, it's quite interesting to me that the, the graph on the right hand side is estimation that people have been doing for a long time, for over 30 or 40 years of yeah, what is what is this this increase that we would see in temperature under double CO2. And as you can see, the, the error bars are quite quite big between 1.5 and, and 4.5. And still, this gives us a, an idea that it can get quite bad. And also, we have to remember that the regional changes are different. So as we were saying before, one degree globally, it may still mean four or five degrees in some, some regions. So this is why models become very, very interesting. And, and I wanted to, to then use this, this headline for the New York Times. It's an article from Nat Silver, who, who many of you will know because of his work in, in politics and, and sport and so on, and, and particularly in elections such like the, the one that Trump won and, and then didn't won. But the, the point of this is that he did a, a lot of work, actually, trying to analyze which fields that were doing predictions were having some skill about the, the future. And what he found is that actually, when you look at things like finance or sport or even politics, the predictions have no skill whatsoever. But the weather forecast actually has a very high level of, of skill. And, and this is worth remembering. And I'm going to explain a little bit about the, the models. And, and I'm going to be doing this just to then try to integrate it in terms of the work with, with machine learning. So why, why do the models work for weather and climate? Essentially, they are just based on, on the physical equations, mainly the Navier-Stoke equations, or they're essentially the, the equations of a, of a fluid in a, in a rotating planet. But the the thing that sometimes is, is forgotten is that the neighbor stock equations on, on its own is not enough. So one of the reasons that you can do weather forecast is because you consider other things like all of the conservation of mass and energy and momentum, and you really impose those on top of your, your neighbor stock equations. And this matters because it's the difference between being able to do a very realistic looking simulation of clouds in a video game, which essentially is done using exactly the same equations than every stock equations, equations, or doing a very skillful forecast of what those clouds are going to be doing tomorrow. So that happens because you are able to bring the continuity and the conservation of mass and energy and, and so on. And that's important. 
But still, even if, if we know that implementing these things is, is complicated, and this is a, a basic schematic of, of how it is done in, in weather and climate models, and, and literally is just a, an exercise in dividing the world in a three-dimensional grid in which you are going to represent all of your, your variables. And, and this kind of triggers many choices, like the different kind of possible grid uh, configurations that you see on the, on the right. One important thing to say is that there are a lot of variables that are included in these in these models from things that are quite obvious and people would think quite quickly about like temperature and, and precipitation and moisture and so on to things that can be quite esoteric like what is the kind of the this speed of, of falling ice particles in a particular type of cloud. So all of those things have been resolved in these models and one of the beauties is that they bring consistency. Of course, these models generate an immense amount of data. So if you want to do a climate simulation, we are literally talking about running these models for, for a few weeks and, and we are generating a, literally kind of an exabyte of data when you are looking at the at the climate simulations that are done these days. And, and that should be a good thing. So if, if the whole issue of having essentially a non-stationary climate and, and the, the challenge that comes with that is a problem for machine learning, the fact that we generate a lot of data should be a, a blessing and a good thing to keep in mind in terms of being able to bring machine learning to help in this in this space. In many ways, the, the difference between weather and climate is, is a balance between how much you want to increase the resolution of the models, how, how much you want to kind of make these kind of grids that I was I was describing before smaller and how much complexity you want to add into the into the system. So this series of plots here, the ones on the left, should give you a feeling of how much the resolution of the models have increased in the last few years. And, and typically now, when we talk about climate simulations, we are talking about the, the plot in the middle, this kind of resolution that, as you can see, is quite a good representation. It does a, a very good job. It's around 10 kilometers of capturing all of the elements of the geography and so on. And in terms of complexity, things have moved a lot. And now we are talking about models that has not only the atmosphere and the land surface and the ocean and the sea ice, but also have a very complex kind of chemistry cycle of all of the, the elements like the carbon and so on that we put into the, into the atmosphere. So bringing all of these things together is where the cost of these simulations come. And, and again, quite a lot of the top supercomputers in the world are fully dedicated to weather and climate just because of the, the cost of, of doing this. Something that, of course, may be, may be fun, particularly for us that we are talking about the Mediterranean, is to, to notice that when we were dealing with models that had resolution of around 100 kilometers, the Mediterranean is a little bit more of a lake than a, than a sea. And, and again, these are some of the, the issues that we have to remember because even if we go then to higher resolutions and we want to do things for cities, we will be talking about kind of features that are going to have 100 meters or, or even less kind of spatial scales. And, and again, this is an area where machine learning in principle can be promising because we are not going to be able to afford the cost of doing this just by first principles and by, by doing the, the physical equations in the way that we have done until, until now. I wanted to show this animation because these things are not only useful, so it's not that we are able to say something useful about what the weather is going to be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow and, and what is going to happen with the climate, but they are intrinsically really, really beautiful. And this is an animation of a particular month of January in, in 2005, and, and it's showing the, the kind of the clouds and the humidity and the precipitation, but it really does a, an amazing job of capturing reality and if you see the little sun that is running on the bottom of the screen, it's telling you when, when the sun is at its peak. And, and if you observe, for example, the Amazon, you can really see it kind of breathing, how at the, the peak of the day, all of the moisture comes out of the, of the trees and, and gets projected into the, into the atmosphere. And as you can see, it's a very complex kind of multidimensional, multi-scale problem. And again, this is going to be a, a challenge when we go into the into the machine learning side of things. But coming back into the climate simulations and how they are done, essentially what happens is once we have these models, we are going to create these scenarios, which I have shown a little bit earlier on, and we are going to put them into the model and say, okay, under this scenario of socioeconomic characteristics that we have considered that are plausible for the future, what happens to the climate? And you just go and, and run it. 
how do these scenarios look like? So they are a little bit like these two paragraphs that I have described here, and they are literally just taken from some of the, the reports in the IPCC. So they tell you things about what is going to happen with the population growth. So do we think that we are going to reach 12 billion or 9 billion? What is going to happen to the economic growth? Is it going to be similar to what we have now, or it is going to change? What type of energies we use? And they gives us an idea of what are going to be then the concentrations of these kind of different particles that we have in the atmosphere, whether it is the CO2, which is the one that is more, more commonly discuss or whether it is methane or N2O in, in the atmosphere. And then once you run them into the into the models, and, and, and again, it's worth remembering that some of the biggest uh, high performance computers in the world are fully dedicated to this just because it's, it's so expensive. You start being able to create these projections, what is going to be happening with the climate in the future. And this is a, a particular example, just summarizing all of the simulations that come from all of the models in the world up to up to the, the year 2003 and 300. And two things to point here. So one is if you just look close to the present, so around the year 2000, you can see that the kind of the global temperature increases are very similar regardless of the scenario. But if you start looking towards the end of the century to the 2100, you can see that these things are, are very, very different. And if we take an even closer look and just focus up to the 2100, you can see now on the left hand side, kind of the global plot and on the right hand side, what is the, the impact that you have in, in kind of the regional uh, parts of the of the world and in, in different parts of the world and two different scenarios and you can see that this is quite remarkable the changes in temperature but still you are going to be seeing the, a very different regional response so what does what does this do in terms of weather and climate so if we really want to use machine learning to help with the climate problem and the ecosystem and biodiversity there are two particular areas where we can do. So one is near to the present, which is what we call adaptation, is what do we deal with the climate variability that we see today? And another one is kind of looking towards the future, which is what is defined as mitigation. Okay, so let's let's really make sure that this doesn't go crazy and we don't put too much CO2. But the sources of uncertainty for those two things are very different. So if we look close to the, to the present, so the left-hand side of these two diagrams, which are giving you a a description of where the variability is coming for either the global or, or just a particular region, the, the, British, the British Isles. What we see is close to the present, the main sources of uncertainty are coming from the internal variability, which is literally things like what is going to be happening to El Nino. Whereas if we look towards the end of the century, the uncertainties are coming from the scenarios. And this matters because we need to remember that these, these scenarios are socioeconomic stories that we have created that we believe that are plausible but it's not necessarily something that we know for sure that is going to happen so let's look at it a bit more closer to the present and what we can do and how we can use machine learning now so again just just reminding that the weather man is not a moron so there is a lot of work that goes here and the reason that we can do things that go kind of months and years ahead and and because people quite often comes with this comment, or, okay, so the weather forecast is not perfect, so how it is that you can tell me something about kind of the weeks or months or years ahead. The reason is because there are elements of the Earth system that evolve more slowly than the atmosphere. So the land surface stores kind of humidity that then it releases, the oceans are a great kind of source of, of latent heat that then we are going to be able to use for the purposes of extracting signals into the into the predictions that we are going to be doing and a little bit of selfies and, and shameless self-promotion so this is a paper that we published a few years ago in which it was the first system actually that was able to do kind of a skillful long-range prediction for for the european and, and north american areas months in in advance so this this can be done and it's something that now we are doing routinely for for many regions but it comes with some some problems there is an issue here which at times is not very much discussed which is that the models also have a, a drift so there are inherent biases in this model so this is a plot that i did i don't know 15 years ago 20 years ago but this is still the same the same story so if you have here the, the solid line is the 
the observations, you have initialized your models and you run them a few months ahead and you have different ensemble members. And is it what we are seeing here, actually a forecast that in this case for El Nino, the, the sea surface temperature is going to get colder or is just telling us that our model has a problem and it has a cold bias. And to correct this, what we do is actually we complete the same type of forecast, but for the last few years in the past. So typically, if you are just doing a forecast a few months ahead, you take at least the last 20 years and you run simulations. And if you are doing forecast for decades, you go even further, you take at least the last 50 years and do simulations. And again, this is very good from the point of view of machine learning, and it's very good to know this. So when we are dealing with adaptation, you should keep in mind that these simulations happen. So there is a huge data set in there of simulations of the, of the past that have been done in exactly the same conditions with similar data simulation and, and so on. One thing that is worth remembering as well, when you are dealing with things in environmental sciences and particularly climate prediction, when you go back into creating kind of a training data set as, as this is really is for, for bias correction, you need to balance not only things like kind of sample size of, of the data set that you are creating, but also that is neutral in things like it has an ENSO neutral. So El Nino is not positive or negative or particular circulation patterns are not positive or negative because otherwise you are biasing your, your sample very much. But once you have this data set, you can then go on and correct. And this is something that is still kind of amazes me really, because a very simple linear correction just gives you something that is very, very skillful. So literally what we do is to take then the average of all of these simulations of the past that we do, construct a kind of a climatology or a, or a reference from those simulations and, and just make a, a linear correction into the future. And this literally works and it works for predictions kind of weeks and months ahead and it works for predictions kind of years ahead. So quite often it's, it's being heard that using these simulations and this data that we generate gives us a very great opportunity because if we adapt to this climate variability that we have today, we will learn to be able to cope with the climate change and the climate variability that we will see in the future. And and there was this great paper, actually, in which some of the biggest names in, in artificial intelligence were involved on, on how to tackle climate change with, with machine learning. And I, I really like the, the paper because it really goes through many of the different sectors about what particular applications. And it does a great job of doing a, a good literature review of what particular techniques can be applied for what particular problem. So I'm, I'm not going to repeat everything that is being said there, and, and I think it would be a, a very good read for, for everybody in the in the call. But I'm going to highlight a couple of, of examples that are presented in that paper for some of the sectors actually that are responsible for most of the emissions of CO2 that we have in the in the atmosphere. So one of them is, is energy and it's already highlighting and dividing the problem in many subcomponents. So we can see in here so if you start from the top right in terms of forecasting supply. And, and being able to accelerate kind of the, the creation of particular materials to develop things like batteries or being able to model kind of the, the emissions from these individual kind of renewable sources or nuclear sources or carbon sources, and then being able to match the demand and the, and the consumption, uh, sorry, the, the production and the, and the consumption of, of energy. So in every single one of these elements, we can bring machine learning. And, and for example, there is already quite a lot of work that is going on in terms of how can we can forecast supply, particularly from renewables that at times the wind is blowing and at times the sun is shining, but other times are not. So we need to be aware that these things are these fluctuations, which again is why the weather and the seasonal and the climate predictions become very useful because it tells us something about that we can merge with the algorithms from machine learning to be able to do better predictions of when we are going to have supply from these sources of energy. At the same time, we can start using things like LSTMs to do a better maintenance of the systems and reduce waste. And we have to keep in mind that this, this is a huge issue. So the, the electric systems currently have around 20% of the energy is just wasted, just moving it, moving it around and, and so on. And we can do things like use reinforcement learning to, to do a better work in terms of the improved scheduling and to optimize the prices and so on, or even to bring things kind of 
like reinforcement learning and supervised learning to improve the materials and deal with things like the battery controls. And this is all, all great and can be done also in the similar way for, for transport. And again, there are plenty of examples in the paper for individual elements in here. So how can you analyze the data to reduce the, the average, uh, average demand for a particular type of transport, or try to move people from one mode of transport into, into another? But there is something that worries me with all of this, and it's, it's one of the things that concerns me in terms of the, the paper. I, I quite like this, this cycle that I present here in this, in this slide. So this is coming from guys that were doing analysis of many organizations and, and businesses in terms of how do they change when new technologies emerges. And in a very, very succinct way, what this technology lifecycle model is, is telling us is that at some point, any industry kind of reaches a, a dominant design. And once you have this dominant design, for example, you, you decide that cars, the best way of doing a car is to have four wheels and a steering wheel, and, and then you just make it better and better little by little. So you go into the incremental improvement until something happens that really changes the way you do. And again, if you take the car industry, the electric car would be a, a good example that it kind of changes the way you think about the whole design of engines and so on, but also the whole distribution of, of energy, things like petrol stations and so on. And you enter a fermentation period in which things are being kind of thought through and people is, is trying to define new, new things. This matters because for me, the critical issue that we see here and, and is mentioned a lot in, in the paper that I was mentioning before in terms of how to use AI to tackle climate change is this thing of the Jevons paradox. So if you are essentially just thinking in a particular dominant design and you are just trying kind of incremental improvements as most of the things that I was describing before for the energy industry or the, or the energy industry, what the Japan's paradox says is essentially you can actually increase the demand you because you are making it easier, you're making it better, you're increasing the demand of this series of things and you're making the overall problem of climate change worse. So I would like to encourage people when we think about this, machine learning in, in many ways is a beautiful disruptive technology. And, and this allows us to think about these problems in a, in a very different way. So I, I would really like to encourage people not really just to use machine learning from the point of view of thinking, okay, how do I solve a particular issue for the energy industry that they have now? But really to rethink how the energy industry can work and, and the same for the transport industry and the same with the agri-food. And there is an example, particularly in that paper that I like, in which they, they highlight the potential that if we all move into having electric vehicles, essentially we all own a battery. And then you have a very different problem in which you can act essentially as a buffer of the energy system. But what does that mean in terms of the, the mental process that a human does? If you have a battery and you can act as a buffer, you can store the energy but you may want to drive at that particular moment in time, how do you start creating systems that really stimulate people and, and treat it as a whole system? So you use the batteries to store things when you are not having enough solar energy or enough wind, and then you kind of encourage people to drive when the energy is happening and you don't need that battery storage. And those problems are quite complex on, on themselves. I wanted to illustrate this, this ability that we have now, this challenge that we have with machine learning to think about these systems in a different way and particularly to think about what are the metrics, what are the loss functions that we are trying to optimize when we try to do something. And I'm, I'm going to use a, very briefly a piece of work that we have been doing together with, with DeepMind. And, and in this case, it's just focus on, on doing very short range forecasts, just doing forecasts for the next couple of hours. But it's very useful to illustrate some of the challenges for the environmental sciences. So the first challenge comes from the data sets are really huge. So I really like this plot that one of the guys in DeepMind, Karel Lenk, put together for, for me, just comparing the typical size of, of images in ImageNet with the typical size of images, even when you are just looking at a single country like the UK, which is not a particularly big country and the radar network that we, that we have. And as you can see, these are much, much bigger images. So this already brings kind of an engineering challenge from the data pipe to be able to consume and, and create algorithms that can deal with these volumes of data in, in one go. 
but it also brings or illustrates other problems, which is what I like to, to talk about the, the tyranny of the, the leaderboard. So in machine learning, so the, the, the way that many problems have been approached has been by defining a particular metric. So it gives me a metric and I, move, I will move the world. I will really create algorithms that are able to hit that metric and learn and be able to do things that are better. And this is what I saw in this, this plot on the, on the left. So we tried different models to tackle this particular problem of how do you give a better prediction for the next kind of 90 minutes uh, ahead of you. And you can see the, the colors of the different lines, but as you can see, there are many of these models that just literally are one on top of the other. If you just simply use this type of metrics, and in, in this case, it's using the critical success in this, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter. It could be any other index and it could be any other variable. The point here is that many different models or algorithms are given as exactly the same response and you would be from a kind of an objective verification point of view you will not be able to distinguish them however when you put these different models in front of experts that have to do something with them and have to make a real world decision with them the picture changes dramatically so there is one of these models that is overwhelmingly preferred by all of the experts. And, and this was a very nice piece of research that we did with quite a lot of experts within the Met Office that have to use this forecast for different uses, whether it is to provide advice to energy or transport or sport events or, or emergency responders, because there is going to be an extreme weather event. So again, this shows that the, the real world is very different at times to the metrics that we use to optimize particular algorithms. So we need to keep that in when we are thinking in this longer term of what it is that we are going to do to really avoid actually frying the, the world for, for future generations. And I, I wanted to remind this plot that really what we are doing now is going to have an impact for, for millennia to, to come unless we are able to invent <clears throat> new technologies that are able to suck this, this carbon from the, from the atmosphere. And I like this, this plot that I, I took from the MIT Technology Review, in which they are trying to illustrate this, this point again that I was, I was making, that if we really want to avoid this, this increase, this very, very dramatic increase of CO2 to something that we believe is reasonable, we really need to have a very drastic reduce of the emissions. And this means that even now, and you can see in this plot, the, the black line is essentially the, the CO2 emissions that we have had according to observations and the colorful lines are potential pathways to reduce this. These reductions are really, really dramatic. So this is not something that will be, will be easy to do. And if we want to do that, we really need to be able to do things that are not just an incremental improvement on the systems that we, that we have. This plot here illustrates what this means for different industries. So you can see for transport or, or buildings or industry or, or electricity in orange, kind of the, the middle plot there. And again, do we have a combination here, as I was explaining, of some socioeconomic scenarios that we construct and the climate simulation. And the impact of these things is, is very, very different. So if we want to really move the world, and if you just look at the plot here, the one in the center in orange for the electricity from the potential kind of situation in which we have the error bars that are quite high and they have very high direct emissions to the ones that are in the bottom that are much lower. We really need to move outside this incremental improvement thinking and really think how can we really use machine learning as a, as a disruptive technology to do things differently. And this matters even for sectors like forestry and agri-food in which you don't see much of a change regardless of the scenario in terms of the CO2 that you emit. Because they come back to the point that I was making very, very early on in the presentation that there are things like biodiversity and the protection of ecosystems that really matter. We will not be able to sustain life as, as we know it if we kind of kill all the insects and, and all, of the, all of the plants. So if you look at all of these things put together, really the issue becomes that mitigating climate change is not just a technical or scientific problem, but it's really a consensus building problem. And, and it's, a, it's a consensus building problem in a non-stationary setting. And this is, this is worth remembering all the time because politics are, are not necessarily data-driven. 
And if you need to be essentially kind of encouraging or nudging the world to go into different scenarios or different possibilities, and I have repeated again the paragraphs here into the two that are kind of the, the business as usual, that is the, the drastic one that I was showing in the red lines earlier on, or the, the kind of the more optimistic one in blue that really decreased. We need to help this consensus building to make better choices. And for me, this is really one of the most interesting challenges for machine learning. How do we do this? And, and I, I find myself quite often just thinking of these, these analogies. So if it is simply as, as if you were taking a, a reinforcement learning problem, and, and in many ways, it feels like climate change is almost a pathological case in which we are fully discounting the future rewards in favor of the instant rewards. And we need to find ways actually of changing that. How do we bring kind of that weight of the future rewards to be more, more heavy and, and useful to do this. So if we only think in this way of thinking that I was presenting before, that the best way of adapting to climate change tomorrow is to adapt to climate variability today, and they are for kind of incremental improvements to energy problems or transport problems are enough. I think we, we trap ourselves in a very difficult situation because this is only true if and only if, if we are able to create a virtual circle between better decision making today that really is data driven and we have a lot of data and I was illustrating the kind of data that we can have from weather and, and seasonal and climate system but also from energy systems and transport systems and the myriad of sensors that we have around the world but then we have the policy making tomorrow which is much more actually ideas driven than necessarily data driven. So we really need to find ways of merging these, these two things. And again, for me, it's really an encouragement for the whole community to really see kind of the machine learning as a, as a proper disruption that really triggers this period of fermentation to rethink how we do certain things and not simply to think as machine learning as a way of just tell me which data you already have for your energy system and I'm going to find a better way of actually just balancing the load that you have that you have now. And with all of that in mind, I just wanted to finish with a couple of well, three three suggestions mainly for for the whole the whole community. So one is to embrace complexity. I don't know that this is this is hard because well the real world is is messy, but if we don't embrace if we don't embrace this this complexity and we simply think okay I need to create a kind of a simple experimental design because that's going to allow me to publish a paper faster and to have it recognized by the community that's great and you manage to publish more papers, but to be honest, that's not necessarily what we need in the real world. So we need to find a way just to create incentives as well for their own community and the way that we reward our people. Because if you are just a postdoc and you want to have a, a job, quite often the first thing that people is going to be looking is for your publications. And if you can publish more, far more easily just by taking kind of an incremental approach of taking data and making algorithm that solves that particular data, we maybe are making ourselves a, a, a disfavor. The second point is about the consensus building. And it's again, kind of reminding ourselves that the problem, particularly when we are dealing about changing the way we behave is quite ideas driven. So we really need to find ways of how to use machine learning and, and beautiful things like they, we have like agent-based modeling or, or quite a lot of the work that is happening now with the human AI teaming. And I really enjoyed the presentation yesterday with, with all of the work in robotics in, in Nottingham. We, we really have to use this to give agency and creativity for human beings and facilitate this consensus building. And, and we know that this is this is possible because we use it quite often in, in the other direction. So we, we should be able to find ways of bringing it to, to kind of play in a, in a positive way. And the final comment, and, and again, it, it plays in the whole area of the consensus. So we have to be very well aware of the inequality and social justice requiring these issues. So there are very clear structural barriers and, and quite often it's, it's very difficult for all of us to think how others feel and, and think about the problem. This is not only for people who are alive now and maybe in developing world or developing countries, but also kind of future generations. And, and of course, it's very difficult for us to put us in the shoes of those future generations. But 
Yeah, it will be it will be hard to justify that we just burn the reserves of energy that have accumulated over millions of years, and then we just left the problem to solve to some people later on. So that was all from me, and thank you very much again for for having me, and I would be happy to take any questions. <laughs>